Hello, everyone. Welcome to the very daunting lecture on aesthetics. My name is Dr. Merrill, and it, this is going to be very cumbersome and very complex. So I've been trying to figure out a way to kind of integrate it as best as possible. And as much as I want to get to the history of aesthetics, what has been said on the subject, I think we have a lot of ground we have to cover first. So, <clears throat> okay, so what this course offers is um, a discussion on the major thinkers' ideas of aesthetics. And while it's mostly philosophers, I did also include some scientists, theologians, psychologists, and even economists. So it's very broad and all-inclusive Western mechanical kind of like disambiguation of what aesthetics is. We're going to have to survey the meanings of aesthetics, beauty, and art, because contrary... <laughs> okay, so, you know, we're going to discuss these, and we're going to discuss them in accordance with other terms, such as taste. And that's the subjective aspect of what pleases, according to the subject's metaphysical, epistemological, and ethical predispositions. And we're also going to have to discuss these terms in accordance with taste and the proper discernments of judgments made about uh, given objects as a means of structuring, of structure and order for judgments. And this would be classifications, categories, and even sometimes something as, I'm sorry, something as practical as taste all um, which are all products of reason. So there is an aspect to aesthetics where reason plays a predominant role in understanding, differentiating, and obtaining beauty. So in this discussion or dialogue or dialectic or whatever you'd like to call this series, um, we're also going to, in a sense, look at why beauty has been abandoned. And you'll actually see this in our lecture series. And there's a bit of a peculiarity here in that it seems like the more explicit aesthetics has become academically the less important it has become culturally. And we'll kind of explain some of this stuff as we go. Um, we also need to demonstrate the exper experiential, psychological, and spiritual need for aesthetics to life. And that's why this is such an issue, why the abandonment is a problem. Um, and perhaps you know, we'll learn something here as we go over this about nature, mostly human nature, or how human existence relates to the nature of existence. And some of these, you know, not necessarily philosophical, but um, metaphysical kinds of abstract ideas are best asked in the proper format, the venue that... Um, vehicles within aesthetics only can. So <clears throat> we I have some concerns and rather I try to concretize these into questions for all of you the viewers in this course and that is simply what rivets you? What catches your eye? and set your imagination on fire. What makes you stop and think? Meaning, what makes you enjoy like a freeze frame of life? 
what makes this all worthwhile and fuels ideas, possibilities, and human achievement for, for and from your own personal creativity. And most importantly, and in the sense most generically, what is beauty? What is beautiful? So hope, just keep these in mind, write them down, kind of think about it, and um, in the comment section, you're always welcome to let me know what you think. I can always adjust or add another uh, lecture uh, addressing some of these issues, or I can just type you back, which whichever <laughs> it seems like it merits. So I have to, we're going to have to reflect a little bit on these abstract questions, but we're going to have to retort with these more particular questions. So I'm answering some questions by asking questions. Um, <clears throat> Even though they're they're difficult questions, they you know they, they might take a long time to answer. Maybe you don't have those answers yet, and that's okay. And some I don't even know if I have all those answers yet. I don't even know if some people ever get to those answers, let alone most people. Um. So. You know. Okay. Okay. So I'll, I'll go ahead and let, let's let's just ask a few. I'll throw in some particular types of aesthetical vehicles into the questions, and maybe that can help you answer these questions. So, you know, is it the Kaufman House designed by architect Frank Lloyd Wright? Or is it, you know, a turbulent sculpture like that of Lacoon and his sons by Anthenodoros, Hagasandros, and Polydorus of Rhodes? Perhaps it's just, you know, perhaps it's a musical symphony performing live, you know, of Vivaldi's Four Seasons. And that is what ignites and kindles, you know, these metaphysical astonishments of existence in your psyche or being. Um, maybe it's something as extravagant as the Sistine Chapel, you know, painted by Michelangelo, or something as simple as painterly colors, you know, applied to a formalist composition like by Mark Rothko. Perhaps it's the written word, such as, you know, the dialectic and creation or the myth of Atlantis and Plato's Timaeus. Or perhaps it's poetry found in Shakespeare's sonnets. So, like, hopefully those kind of questions, it shows you what we're dealing with. Um, whereas well, I'll, I'll get into why these terms are different, but how they relate later. But the, these are particulars that might help you with more abstract or generalized questions. And this one's going to be very difficult. And this, in a sense, is what I have outlined the least in my uh, lecture notes here. But that is, we have to make some sort of epistemological assumption. Um, even more so, I think, than metaphysical ones, um, and that is because of how the mind works. We don't really look at things metaphysically, culturally anymore. It has been rejected and just kind of left to theologians, but you at least have to have some sort of metaphysical... Um, predisposition, or like what the objectivists, for instance, call the metaphysically given. So it's just the universe according to the senses. So they don't go into extreme depths, even like Aristotle did on, you know, all of these categories and and being and motion and causality and laws of non-contradiction and identity and excluded metal. But all of these would be metaphysical things. You know, do we live in an orderly universe or is it chaotic? Um, if we get Kantian, is it just, it's just what is in our mind is really all of that existence is because we're too, in a sense, far removed logically from sense data. 
Um, so, I mean, it depends on what school you're from. And maybe you don't have a school, and that's fine. Um, you will find that the Platonic school is probably the most influential in its various derivatives and um, changes, but on on the early history of of what aesthetics later entails, he kind of gives us a bit of an idea of where that formal branch of philosophy will go. But um, what I'm trying to say is we have to kind of have some sort of established base because philosophy works in a hierarchy. So you have your metaphysics as the bottom of the period. And that's like I said, that's, you know, just the ontological questions. What does it mean to be? And then you have your second tier, which is epistemology. That's the theory of knowledge. How do we know, you know, that we know? How do we know about this existence that is has a primacy over that that is more fundamental and then you move up into ethics um, which deals of course with morality and ethical code into politics how you kind of project an ethical code more generally and at the same instance more particularly meaning amongst multiple individuals of a sovereignty or a nation or state and then outside of politics and above, you have aesthetics, um, which is very difficult because a lot of people want to put it into the political camp. And in some sense, it, it it's lesser than because you have to have a political system before you can have an aesthetics or maybe not have an aesthetics. Plato, even though he had the heart of a poet, banished artists uh, from, and poets, rather, poets, um, from his city because he wanted to essentially control the minds of the populace. So you can't have lies and wrong pop propaganda. You had to have right propaganda. So artists are, in fact, censored or just dismissed. And therefore, in his tier, you wouldn't even have an aesthetical system, or a very limited one anyways. So it comes out of it rather than before it. <clears throat> well, psychology kind of branches outside of epistemology, because obviously we're dealing with the workings of the mind, of the soul, the study of what... You, um, different temperaments, well, how they function and, and how they process their environment. So in our epistemological assumptions, we have to look at the general processes of the mind before we can presuppose any sort of aesthetics. So essentially, I'm going to try to do this the best I can, the human mind is complex and it's a posteriori meaning it's based after experience not prior to experience so it's rather malleable and we're blanket births so kind of more like what i would call a tableau rasa blank slate you know there's been evidence of this when you when a baby colt uh comes out of um you know the mother's womb within an hour it's already up and running around like what a grown horse would do it already knows everything it's already pre-programmed and the human mind when we look at it uh, the gray matter is rather blank at birth um, and over time it develops more wrinkles and the neurons get thicker before they prune of course and all of this I don't want to get into a, a giant neurobiological uh, talk here, but um, these sensations that we get from the world, they pass through the sensory registers of the mind, and they build a cognitive memory. Memory, of course, is stored, and it is 
subconsciously as well as unconsciously accessed by the particular temperament. Nurture has a lot to do with it, more than biology. And then these memories and the categories uh, of the understanding, and it's not to be confused with Kantian categories. Similar, but it's, it's not the same thing. It's not as limiting. We're not talking about Aristotelian categories of the platonic forms, and that's all that really matters and is verifiable to existence. No, I believe in direct perception, and that's what we're going to talk about here. So these, anyway, these memories and the categories of the understanding are condensed and they're monetized through a thought-based currency, you know, as an analogy here, which can be conceptually measured, logically um, collaged and condensed. So this is similar to the objectivist epistemology theory, uh, which is uh, differentiation and integration and a hierarchy of concepts. This works very similarly here. Um, and, and simply put, so the perceptual datum is translated into the memory banks and then the memory is logically processed into impressions and events. These are different. So impressions fall more under sort of beatific kinds of judgments and then the events fall usually more so under the the practical types of or ethical judgments <clears throat> so the latter um is the conceptually condensed and subjective palette um which is based in this logically deductive impression uh, so this is maybe where it gets a little bit more complicated, but when we look at the process of the mind in accordance to judgments, uh, you have the cultivated and experienced mind now, and it is able to discern logical judgments, meaning it's able to understand how it's processing these judgments. Okay, so this includes, you know, your visual, auditorial, tactile, tasteful, and conceptual judgments. The conceptual judgments are processed above, and it's more general, you know, than these other judgments. The, the conceptual judgments are the most universal of judgments, but strangely are faculties that are tools drawn out of the mind for the more particular i.e., you know, the, the ethical and artful purposes. The lesser and more superfluous tier of judgments, e.g., the, you know, we're talking about the visual and the auditorial ones here, their particular impressions or preferences in these spectrums of disgust to relief. Okay, so it's what we desire the most to what we desire the least. And they are judgments that guide any given subject's temperament to particular tastes or strategies, expediencies, tactics, you know, that lead the subject closer, in a sense, to beauty. Beauty, I'm using very broadly here, as a fulfillment of what, whatever kind of achievement or idea that this subject would want to to attain. And then when we look at taste and judgment, not tasteful now, not talking about uh, what food tastes like, but taste in the sense of a preference. So, okay, so these latter judgments of beauty, they can assist the subject's preferences, taste, towards the most salient things, you know, e.g. furnished home, the most compatible and beautiful spouse, care of the body, clothing of the body, and a, a developed and, you know, quasi-consistent of of musical, creative, you know, narrative choices based on their temperament. So even the way in which a person decorates objects around them, you know, they're based in their personal uh, beatific judgments. 
regardless of some sort of synthetical or sensory kind of psychology of the person. Because some, some personalities are more prone at one extreme to sensual gratification, whereas other personalities are more synthetical, meaning they absorb and they're, they're more big picture kind of people. Not living in the moment, but um, stepping back and maybe feel more removed from their body, but they're better at seeing patterns and including social and historical cultural patterns. So, I mean, obviously, both can attribute a lot culturally to um, particular art forms that can be purchased or appropriated from by anybody else in the society to fulfill their personal beatific visions. I really like this designer's table. I really like this graphic design poster. And then they're able to, you know, these other people are able to take that and, and build up their own vision of what they want their life to really look like. Whatever reflects their personality or their interests or their desires, maybe even based on their deficiencies. Like, I wish I was more like, you know, I, I wish I was more like James Bond, but I'm the exact opposite. So I've always loved James Bond, um, and I'm obsessed with that. It, it is a, it's a cathartic kind of realm of desire, and, and it's distant, so I, I don't have to deal with the, the over-bombardment of sensation outside of the motion picture or outside of Ian Fleming's book, but I'm, I'm able to... Uh, refuel my consciousness, as the objectivists put it, based in this work of art. So um, the last bit I have here before we move on from the epistemological assumptions would, would be the idea of genetic beauty, and I think this is more universal. There have been other writers. Darwin had mentioned some stuff about beauty, um, as well as uh, the, the two resources, Ellen Desenayake and Dennis Dutton, uh, the late Dennis Dutton, who wrote a great book, uh, The Art Instinct. And in any way, let, let me, I'll, I'll read my note on this. So I would suppose, you know, the majority of all of you watching find natural beauty, you know, of a landscape, even, even maybe, maybe the human form. But let's just stick with the landscape. You know, I'd say that you probably find it breathtaking or inducing of contemplation. So Dennis Dutton, the aesthetician, wrote The Art Instinct, and he espoused the idea of a Darwinian theory of beauty and art. So like a landscape is universally beautiful to humans because of the origin of our species, in which we are part of and psychologically adapted to nature. So like when the Cro-Magnon man, you know, hunted and gathered and lived in the Pleistocenes, he got accustomed to an implicit natural sense of beauty that has become innately infused in the human condition. It's not innate ideas, but it's more like, um, like why you're afraid of snakes, you know, or, or maybe why you might be wary of a cliff edge or something like that. And it's because we're, we're, we're trained by, you know, fears of our ancestors. And it's, in a sense, genetically brought down to protect us as we continue to evolve and promulgate our species. Well, beauty would, in a sense, fall under that. We, you know, we all want to sit around and stare at a fire. There's just something so innately comforting about that. Well, it was to the Crow Magnon whenever he was sitting in his cave talking to family and grunts and groans around a fire, you know. So it's it's natural and it's 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 stuck with us outside of our intellectual development as a species. And 
our desires, I guess I should go back to that and talk a little bit about this because um, desires would still fall under some sort of epistemological assumption as well. So like we have the desire to fulfill you know, our own human lives. We want to create and procreate. We want to expand our knowledge and skills as we create a better, more meaningful world. Um, and this is because it's not only our nature, but it is the intellectuality of being a human where we want to discover. You know, Aristotle said, you know, all men desire to know. This is how he opens the metaphysics, you know, all men desire to know. And we know this because of the delight that we partake in the pleasure of our senses. And, and that this couldn't lead to a more beautiful, you know, understanding of, of what beauty is. So, you know, how are we going to achieve this in the given time that we have? It's very difficult. Sometimes it's not linear. We have to sometimes take two steps back before we can take one step forward. And we're kind of fickle and, and we forget. It's just our nature. So we discover again by creating and we create to discover. Thereby, you know, in turn, like everything that we can, we are driven biologically as well as spiritually to, to, to act, to craft. And, and we are in awe of the marvels, you know, that nature has taught us. Um, and now further removed, in, in some respects, in, in a more a narrow view, um, what we have taught ourselves. So our desires are kind of like these, they're universal enough, they're like archetypal ideals of the mind. And they play an important role in the lifelong pursuit and our own personal fulfillments of a beatific vision. You know, these could be hedonistic, that basic, pleasure and pain. Like, that's what we're looking for. Something that guides us more to, to simple pleasures. Um, maybe it is just um, religious. Maybe it's dietary. It's social. Maybe it's about innate beauty. And so, therefore, maybe it's just more philosophical. So inherently, when we finally reach these goals, we have achieved our own beatific vision. But most folks become cynical and dissatisfied. That's the flip side of this. It's part of the human condition. So we're always, you know, left with an ever larger hole that we have to keep filling in our quest of life. But some of these kinds of questions that I asked at the beginning of this introductory lecture will lead us into a better understanding of ourselves universally and particularly as an individual. Um, and, and, you know, what, what we can actually get from the culture, what we can gravitate to and understand from what other thinkers in Western civilization have given us, and, and maybe find where there's deficiencies, where we, you know, we continue to innovate and we're able to answer particular questions that we wouldn't have been able to otherwise. So, th that kind of, I hope, gives you a taste of like what we need to cover in this lecture. And it's very difficult, but it can be done. Um, and this should be the my area of expertise, but in some sense, it's what I know the least about. But that's the beauty of it. I, I want to keep coming back and, and I keep reading other, you know, ideas. I go to a museum, sometimes just walking down an alleyway. The, there's, there's this weird play and kind of tension or conflict between beauty and ugliness going down a, a back alley somewhere. But it makes the, the deficiencies can make, make things of a positive nature that we're trying to figure out of beauty more 
attainable. Beauty can be found in anything. 